It's August the 6th, 1939. The Wehrmacht is pushing eastwards. The slaughter has begun. The first line of the Polish defense are retreating and they prepare to fortify the cities. According to the Allied plan, this is a time for British and French counterattacks. If it weren't for the Italians. In early August, the Italian army launched a summer offensive across the Alps. It is no easy place to wage war. Both sides use elite mountaineers bolstered with regular infantry. The French forces were prepared but inferior in number. The Italians massed towards Barcelonette and soon the mountains were crawling with them. The French had their mountain forts and the Italians had to pay for every step. It was messy. The Axis aggression made several other nations react. Australia and New Zealand joined the Allies and the non-isolation movement in USA got a lot of new support, which made it possible for Roosevelt to gear up for war a little bit more efficient than before. It was actually the Italian declaration of war that shook the Americans the most. The Führer may come to pay for bringing the deuce so early. German and Italian submarines had started to raid Allied convoys. For the United Kingdom, this threat had high priority and several sub-hunting task forces with smaller support carriers and destroyer had been created. The German U-boats were hard to catch, but in this case, the 10th of August, a surface meeting between German and Italian U-boats was intercepted and although none were sunk, they were damaged and scattered. British carrier planes made reconnaissance flights over Sardinia. The Italians had based quite a few troops here, although mostly militias it seemed. Sardinia was important as it held strategically important airfields and produced a lot of rare materials. Nevertheless, Italian submarines were detected in port and naval bombers were dispatched to attack them. Cagliari's light anti-aircraft emplacements fired away best it could, although it didn't stop the bombers from wreaking havoc in the port. Also this time, the submarines took hits, but managed to flee and dive without significant casualties. The Brits had hoped that the carrier task force waiting outside the port in the Gulf of Tunisia would be able to intercept them, but they failed. Although no enemy submarine was sunk during August 1939, actions by British naval and air forces disturbed their raiding activities several times and damaged vessels. As a result, convoy losses during the summer was not too bad. In the Mediterranean, they were surprisingly small. It may be due to the fact that several Italian submarines seem to have been sent to the Atlantic before the war and before the Brits closed the Sound of Gibraltar. Good evening boys and girls and welcome to another day of carnage. This is Captain Easy. So we have a war. A beautiful bloody and awful war. Poland is fighting and struggling here. Uh, Italy is in the game, in the war, and are trying to push through France in the south, as we actually expected a little bit, so we weren't uh, completely taken and with our pants down. Uh, Germany is not doing anything here, but we are uh, and not extremely successful for the moment. But uh, who knows, we might be able to do something in, in Pirmasens. We'll see about that. And then uh, I am doing a few things over here in the northern part of Germany. Uh, it's nothing really serious. It's mainly to um, keep, you know, 
keep him on his toes. But he is attacking me with his um, with his bombers, and he's fairly successful in that, um, which is good game-wise, but it's not good for my my plane. Now I'm moving in a, a carrier fleet here, so I hope that next time he comes he will meet stiffer resistance. But I'm gonna re retreat out from these places uh, and wait and see what he's doing. If he's not retaking them, I might come in with a greater force, but, but this is just uh, to, uh, to tease him a little bit. Uh, and and, and uh, Nice. And force him to um, to act on it. It's always good to take a little bit of German heartland as well, just to show them that we do have teeth. So that's that's all for now. Just a short one. So keep on following up, and you will get more carnage within short. The trip on the North Sea, locked into that transport ship, had not been too bad. At least not as bad as prison would have been. Some pansies broke and cried or threw up, and Jesse had punched one in the face to make him stop. I did, eventually. The troop wished for land, but to bloody get there was a nightmare. Had Fritz placed just a few Hitler Jugend fools on the coastline with bows and arrows, it would have been suicide. Jesse Thorpe realized the brass had no clue what they were doing and his pulse was hammering in his ears as he stumbled up on the shore. He was so angry he hoped the Germans would oppose them. As they moved into Hanbury, Jesse was searching for any kind of resistance among the civilians. Damn German swines. The first to even talk to him got a smack of their rifle across the teeth. Ugh. It was so odd to move around in, in an enemy city. Well, there were no battle, and Jesse wondered how the hell he would prove himself. How could he wash away his disgrace? At least death in combat would make him as good as his father. Well, as he moved around to secure a couple of factories, he realized what a rich city Hamburg was. The old street thug awoke in Jesse, and he soon realized how he could do something for his mother. Before shipping out, he broke into a store in central Hamburg and stole two golden candlesticks. In mid-August, it was clear that the defense in Barcelonette would not hold. The Italians were simply too many. The French had reinforced the south with a few new divisions, but it would not be enough. The Royal Air Force sent Scholte Douglas and four squadrons of Hurricanes to deal with the Regia Aeronautica. The Italian Air Force proved inferior opponents, especially in comparison with the feared Luftwaffe. This meant, however, that the Allied lost the last hope of gaining air superiority against Germany. As the situation was alarming, the Allies agreed that the Brits would send half their expeditionary force to southern France. This would hopefully be enough to stop the Italian advance. It was a mix of light and medium armor, as well as a lot of motorized infantry. The Poles could not stand the pressure of the German machinery of war. Their defense was crumbling. This was ill news. If the Poles fell, the Allies would be significantly weakened. Could they even stand up against Germany in Italy? Dangerous thoughts. The French, rightfully fearing their safety, invested a lot in diplomacy and various shady operations. Hungary was one of the priorities. French diplomats had influenced several Hungarians around the fascist-loving knot of core politicians. In a cunning coup, two fascist politicians and a general were killed, and a brotherhood of democratic politicians seized power. They would never turn to the Axis now. 
but maybe to the Allies. The 23rd of August, the Soviet Union annexed three Eastern Baltic states. Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. This was the same date as Warsaw fell to the Germans. A dark date indeed. After the disaster of Stuttgart, the strategic bombers and their crews spent weeks on the ground to repair, reinforce and debrief. Now they were used, not in hotspots, but deep inside Germany where they attacked valuable industry. This was how Cyril Newell wanted it, and a few missions, such as this one over grass, was reasonably successful. In late August, the Italians reached into southern France, seizing Barcelonette and a few other French mountain forts. With the two British army corps soon ready to operate, the British leadership scouted the stability of the Italian front. Except a thin coastal defence line, their lands behind their advancing army was empty. This was interesting and opened up for various kinds of pincer manoeuvres. And so far, the Regia Marina seemed not very eager to engage the Allied fleet. The Allies thus arranged a conference on how to best carry out a counteroffensive in northern Italy. It was payback time 